Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the um, June 18, 2024 Economic Development Authority meeting. Um, I hope that everyone had a good weekend. Whether well, it's hot, it's going to be a hot summer. Only thing hotter than this summer is going to be Portsmouth. Ooh, a great year. <laughs> <laughs> so given that, why don't we start off with roll call? Okay. Good morning, and thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Barber is absent. Mr. Mitchell here. Mr. Brown here. Mrs. Saunders Smith here. Ms. Mrs. Smith is absent. Uh, Mr. James here. And Mr. Harmon here. Chair, we do have a quorum. I trust that everyone had an opportunity to review the May 21st meeting. If there are no changes or revisions, I move for adoption. Second. <laughs> by Chair Mitchell and a second by Commissioner Brown. During the discussion, the role, Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Saunders Smith? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. And Mr. Harmon? Yes. Chair, the item is adopted by a vote of five to zero. Okay, we'll move into old business. All right, you walk us through the uh, Yes, sir. Uh, eleven seventeen and eleven twenty one High Street. I think commonly uh, we've been referring to this as the uh, former Shiny Computers uh, location. Um, as previously uh, discussed, we are in the process of issuing a uh, invitation for bids uh, for the replacement of the uh, roof uh, for both of the addresses on the property. Uh, working with the city purchasing office to, uh, to issue that solicitation. So we hope to have that out on the street uh, potentially by the end of June. And then uh, the intent would be to have uh, bids uh, by uh, August uh, to commence work uh, immediately thereafter. Uh, we have packaged that uh, so that we have some flexibility based on the pricing as it comes back um, on how to proceed. Really, the, the pressing and urgent matter is 1117 High Street, but 1120 is, is in need of replacement soon as well. So we're we're putting both out. So we will uh, keep you abreast of that at your July meeting and uh, we have an update on a status at that time. Um, and just jump back. Thank you, Amy. Um, we have been working as well uh, for uh, some work on the inside and then exterior of the, uh, the building and the site. Um, so we have obtained a um, Proposal from uh, Mosley Architects, uh, which is a architect that the city uh, has under an annual uh, services contract. Um, I've actually uh, I've provided copies of the proposal um, at your place at the table. Um, you'll see that the uh, total uh, cost for the architectural and engineering work uh, to design the interior, um, I guess, build out uh, for creating a vanilla shell. Uh, so that we can market the property um, as well as overhauling the exterior of the property to include the parking lot, landscaping, any necessary lighting um, is uh, $99,539. That's really kind of a turnkey package uh, for the construction documents, uh, bidding administration and the construction admin as well. Um, and again, this uh, the intent is to uh, create a space at 1117 high uh, that we can put on the market as it is right now. It's it's really um, not in the condition that, in my opinion, we can lease. Uh, there's some needs for uh, for some plumbing and electrical uh, upgrades, as well as uh, the overall floor plan and layout. Um, and then really on the outside, making the building a um, contributing structure to the innovation district. Uh, right now, I would call it a blight on the communities, but it really is is not the, anything that's uh, a showpiece, uh, if you will. So I, I think the intent would be to make this really a, a uh, an anchor uh, property at that main intersection there of Elm and High Street. And uh, the uh, proposal that you have before you will um, allow for that to, to occur. Um, at this time, I like to open up for any questions or discussion, but uh, we would be looking for your direction to uh, to move forward with procuring the work and uh, beginning the process of the We need a motion. 
You need a motion uh, or you want a discussion? What's the discussion? Jeff, would we need any formal action? What would be your recommendation uh, uh, to proceed with the actual contract? For yes, but uh, yeah, we should do a motion second. Okay, I'm questioning that we proceed with the uh, the construction costs associated with uh, 117 and 1121 High Street. I'll second it. Okay, please bear with me just as I note the, uh, the motion down, uh, which was made by Treasurer Sandra Smith and it's second by Mr. Brown, is there any discussion on the item? Um, the, the only uh, discussion I have, it's not with the motion, is that um, it is a anchor piece of property, as you mentioned. Uh, I know at some point we're going to talk about the things that we do not want in the enterprise zone, but equally, I think a conversation is needed about what we want in the enterprise zone. And I know at one point we talked about uh, maybe visiting uh, Richmond or some other cities to kind of get some thoughts and ideas in terms of what they have done. Um, so I just want to make sure we do engage in that conversation. I think it's important. Yes. Uh, question. So with creating this vanilla shell for this property, are we going after renovations in terms of a existing developer going in and using the current building or giving them the option to demolish it? Uh, so the intent here would be to preserve the uh, existing structure. Uh, we're going to be improving the interior of 1117, one of the two addresses, um, overhauling the complete exterior from both addresses uh, so that we could lease uh, the property at 1117 High uh, Street. Um, 1121 is occupied. We do have a tenant in that property. There is a uh, environmental company that operates out of that and leases that. Okay. Uh, but the intent would be to, to preserve the property and continue to have it on. Okay, thank you. And it also has access to the um, high speed fiber network actually comes into that building, which is another plus that we look for possible uses. Great point. Hearing no other um, discussion items, I will proceed with the, uh, the role here. Okay. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brown? Yes. Saunders Smith? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. And Mr. Harmon? Yes. Here, the item is approved by a vote of five to zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, your next item, we're actually moving right across the street here to uh, the property at 1020 High Street, uh, 1013, 1015 Queen, and 400 Hatton Street. Uh, they commonly refer to as the uh, the Holmes property, Meridian Homes, um, which you'll see on the overhead uh, highlighted there uh, in yellow. Um, do you have an update for you? As you're aware, we've been under contract on these properties for some time. The closing has been delayed, and um, we have received an update that Closing looks imminent, um, and I'm going to ask uh, Deputy City Attorney uh, Mr. Miller to just kind of provide a quick update on that, that status. Yeah, sure. You all may recall that uh, the original owner of this property passed away, and also that we had some issues where uh, it wasn't clear that he actually owned all the property, and that had to be resolved by a uh, court action uh, to confirm his ownership and also to have his uh, state representative substituted into the contract. All that's been done. And so we are hopeful of having this closed by the next time you meet. Oh, wonderful. That's, that's good news, you know. It's a long road. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't emphasize enough. We have in our possession two key pieces of property in the prior zone, and we have an opportunity to set the standard in terms of what can be expected in that area. And um, something we've always wanted on this board mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to have an impact of this nature. So I'm terribly excited about it as we all. Okay, well, um, next month we have a lot. 
We'll have a, another update okay. uh, with I think we'll, what will be some good news, and then we'll have a probably a follow up discussion with um, you know next steps yep. once we acquire the property. Uh, there obviously is a, a quite a bit of work that needs to be done there, yep. so we'll begin the process of uh, preparing to brief you on what those steps are at your July meeting. Quick update for you on uh, Craddock um, and the Afton Square uh, district uh, within the Craddock community. Um, as you're aware, we have acquired uh, three properties in uh, Afton Square. Um, the uh, first was the bank building there at 53 Afton, and then we acquired the vacant lot um, on the uh, top portion of the square at uh, 60 Afton Parkway, and then a uh, small warehouse at 73 Farragut Street. The warehouse has been demolished. Uh, we've heard that that had a, a very positive impact on the community. I, I believe there um, have been some individuals kind of congregating around that building, so that has uh, helped to resolve that issue. Uh, there is also a city-owned uh, parcel uh, where the community garden is located, um, and that property at some point uh, would need to be transferred from the city to the EDA if we're looking at a potential full-scale redevelopment of those properties. Um, and that is something that the uh, city manager uh, had uh, indicated at your May meeting. Um, we will be working with uh, Harvey Lindsay to begin marketing these properties. Um, I have reached out to the uh, Craddock Civic League um, regarding the city owned property as there is a community garden that is located on that property. I've had some discussions with the president of the, uh, the Civic League and uh, they have indicated that there is an alternative location where that garden can move to. And um, I will be attending their meeting uh, in September to kind of brief them on our plans for marketing the property uh, for redevelopment and revitalization, and um, also looking at determining what that move for the garden would be after the growing season. Um, so that, uh, that's the update for today. Commissioner Moore. Speaking of the crowd specifically, have they abandoned the um the plan that they came with with Bracy Park, the that development plan? They didn't pass it on to somebody after Bracy left and just great question. Um I did ask. Um I do not believe that there is a um at this time a current interest in carrying forward those plans. They they had um, established a community development corporation that um, seems to be somewhat inactive at this point in time since Mr. Parr has departed the Civic League. Um, I, I do believe they're they're very interested and focused on um, Afton Square, um, but the uh, organization is not uh, pursuing the CDC at this time. So are there elements from from Bracey's proposal, from Bracey's presentation that we could consider as the EDA about those buildings that we've acquired? Um, so the, the the parcels that we own uh, currently, I think uh, we'll be moving forward with the plans to, you know, advertise those solicit development interest. Um, and uh, as they're marketed, uh, Ryan and the day and Harvey Lindsay will you know, bring us some, some offers and proposals. Uh, we were looking at additional properties to acquire, a um, few of which have gone up to auction. Um, unfortunately, we were not successful in acquiring this. We, we were hoping to have more of a, uh, a massing of you know, real estate right, assets, right. but uh, the private sector has kind of board. jumped in. And, yeah. you know, I, in all honesty, I haven't seen activity there, so I'm not sure what those plans were. Uh, but unfortunately, we weren't successful at auction and acquiring those mm. parcels. Well, that was the movie theater, the old theater part. Uh, we had worked with the owner of the movie theater to to get that under contract, and then um, they decided not to move forward. Uh, the adjacent property uh, went to auction, and um, we were outbid. Okay. There's a third property in that block where the theater is um, that I do believe uh, also went to auction or was planned for auction, um, and being that we don't have the adjacent two properties we determined it wasn't feasible really to move forward with that. But I do believe with what we have currently in the inventory, there there's an opportunity to make an impact in Craddock mm -hmm. and um and cause some you know some benefit and some Yeah, I was positive. I was excited about Bracey's plan playing off for that being America's first shopping center and just revitalizing it as a as a boutique shopping area. I thought that was a great look for the area. 
I still think it's a possibility. Yeah. I think yeah. we just need to get you know, some activity, some traction, and um, have some potential new uh, residents, and, and then obviously the businesses. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Autumn Bailey uh, to provide an update on the next item, which is the small business events update. Morning, everyone. Morning. So today I'll be talking about um, Shopper Block High Street Fest. So our EDA board um, allowed us to uh, do an event this summer, a block party um, that has morphed into a festival. Um, so we are holding an event from on High Street from Dinwiddie to Effingham. So we'll be closing the street and having a festival to uh, bring attention and foot traffic to our businesses on High Street. The event is July 6th um, from 12 to 5. That's the first Saturday in July. Um, we have hired an event planner. Um, Coffee Black, Markel Bonds is um, in coordination with Nicole Events, um, is coordinating the events and meeting with the businesses and arranging for artists and <laughs> installation um, to execute the event. We will have two stages. We will have DJs and live bands. Right now, the Portsmouth Marketing Department has initiated a marketing campaign that went out, I believe, Tuesday. Um, so that is active. There will be um, social media posts, radio um, advertisements. We have two billboards in Portsmouth with um, advertising. Um, so we have a full-blown uh, marketing campaign. Um, the event planner is networking with the businesses on High Street to um, incorporate activities in their space that will drive traffic to their businesses. Um, so right now he is enlisting businesses. Um, we have probably about 10 businesses now that are interested in having activities in their space. We will have a fashion show um, that will incorporate um, clothing businesses, retailers on High Street that will, um, they will all have their, their clothing involved in the fashion show to highlight their businesses. There will be a skateboarding ramp. Um, we will use one of the businesses or the library on High Street to have small business courses, classes, trainings. Um, we're trying to incorporate a pitch competition. Um, we have a children's area. There will be bounce houses. Um, we are hoping to have one of our local businesses teach some um, skateboarding classes. Um, and then there will be other activities for children as well. Um, currently, we have a website that was um, initiated by um, Amy, the highstreetfestival.com. Um, if you look in front of you, we have our flyer. So this is currently out in the world. And we are we are um, excited for the event. Um, any questions? Mark Hill is a good Mark Hill Barnes is a good event planner, so you should have a you should have a successful so some success working with him. Yes, yeah. we, we went through the um the bidding process um and we found him to be the most capable. He has um initiated the Juneteenth Festival for the past two years, so we felt very comfortable with the connections and the city government that he has that's making this process move along very smoothly. We are three weeks three weeks away from the event. Hope to see you all there. <laughs> any other questions? Are there any opportunities? to integrate some health services there. So maybe with uh, Bond Secure, they can do blood pressure checks or, or things like that since there's yeah. so many people. Um, so the um, the event planners were um, passing out flyers to vendors at Juneteenth this past weekend. So we have been contacted by the um, Department of Health. So they plan on having a table. Um, we are reaching out to Bond Secure, so I provide them with a list of our resource partners so that they can have a table exhibit. So we do want to have fire and EMS. We want to have several city agencies. Um, we do want to have bond support. So we're hoping that they'll be open to have a table set up and just talk about the programs that they have because the Department of Health has a, a lot of programs that would be useful right. for the community. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Good job. There's a lot of a lot of buzz um, around this event already. And um, 
you know, the intent or hoping for is that this is going to really drive track uh, traffic uh, westward down High Street. Um, we see it in our first uh, Saturdays of the month when the farmers market and the flea market uh, coincide. Um, that you know, the 300 block, the 400 block of High Street um, have several thousand visitors every weekend. But um, we've heard that the businesses in the five, six, 700 block as you head westward towards Effingham mm -hmm. don't always benefit from that traffic. So the uh, the hope is that this will help um, drive many of those visitors um, down the street and. Um, provide some exposure to the, you know, the businesses, retailers, restaurants that we've got, um, uh, which are, that's a considerable number as you get further down. It's just a little bit of a walk. So if, hopefully this will interest folks to, to move in that direction. Yeah, one other thing I um, didn't mention is there will be opportunities for vendors to have table setups as well. So we're hoping they will line the center of the, the median uh, on both sides. So. Um, if you know anyone that would be interested in vending, um, volunteering, um, just uh, or a business that probably want to have an installation in their space, uh, please send them to our website. Everything, all the registration is on the website for them to participate. Are we able to put any type of postage or signage on the ferries so that people that happen to be running, um, riding the ferries? Yeah, so we're making, um, we, we adjusted the street blockage. Um, so as soon as we can get the flyer corrected to indicate then we need to Effingham, then we will be printing flyers to put in the windows of businesses. And we can definitely approach the ferry to have a flyer in their um, location as well. Great. That's a great question. Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Autumn, and uh, thank you to um, the EDA, uh, our boards, for your sponsorship of the event and helping to make it happen. So, uh, without you, it wouldn't be possible to hold and uh, host the um, the festival. Okay, we're going to uh, transition to uh, our new business items on the agenda, and um, the first item is a presentation uh, by uh, Black Brand. And we have uh, with us from Black Brand is uh, Blair Durham. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Blair for you to introduce yourself and uh, share all the exciting things that you're doing uh, on behalf of the uh, the region and Portsmouth Blair. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I apologize for my tardiness. You never know what the little people, what they may have going on in the morning. Uh, but very excited to be here again to share this information. Um, and this is really in harmony with what Autumn was just sharing. This is about building capacity for small businesses in Portsmouth. Um, can you go through the next slide? Yeah, okay. No worries. So just a bit about our history uh, in terms of partnering with the city of Portsmouth. Uh, we did host Black Diamond Weekend, which is our annual conference of the hybrid edition, obviously that. 20th forward. Uh, we also participated as the uh, education program for the Startup Stability Program that was hosted at Dream Coworking, uh, providing Black-owned businesses access to capacity building workshops in 2021. And then our educational programming is the longest running program at Bloom, with at least one cohort annually since uh, Bloom's inception, including our B-Force Accelerator Program as well as our Surge Community Business Academy. That has met 88 unique participants, uh, 56 workshops, 760 hours of technical assistance. So we're talking about one-on-one -on -one support with accounting professionals, finance professionals, uh, attorneys, et cetera. And then we have also prepared diligent businesses to receive the courts of CDA uh, grant funding through those programs as well. So I want to share just a bit about what is coming online here in Portsmouth. Uh, we are gearing up for the ninth annual Black Diamond Weekend. Um, it's gonna be held at the Renaissance Hotel, um, uh, November 7th, 8th, and 9th. So we're really excited about that. This is the largest convening of Black business owners and corporate professionals in the state of Virginia. And excitedly, this is our first in-person Portsmouth conference. Um, so it looks like five content-driven tracks, you name it from a business perspective, um, there is something for everyone 
We are excited to host the Portsmouth Pitch Night, where we hope to feature businesses that are both in the blue market as well as those that have received funding uh, from the city of Portsmouth. There's an opportunity fair where our corporate members will have exhibitor booths, um, as well as some small business uh, booths as well. There's a gala and awards and a couple of other uh, fun networking events. We have rented out uh, a yacht, so there'll be a, a networking cruise that is being sponsored by the Navy Energy on Saturday morning. Uh, we are bringing three celebrity speakers so in contract uh, negotiation with those individuals now. Um, it is about 50 hours of content. We do expect 600 to 810 Bs, um, just in terms of the way we're revving up our marketing with the celebrities um, up for 430 and 4.3. So our ask is uh, that Portsmouth would consider the presenting sponsorship um, for this particular conference. It's a $50,000 ask. We're also looking for in-kind marketing support of up to $30,000. So being that every time we promote this event, we will be promoting the city of Portsmouth, we'd love to have your help in doing that. You'll join a long list of uh, sponsors and supporters of this event. Definitely some uh, city there, some corporate entities, some banks that I'm sure you recognize. Uh, this is just a look back. I won't read everything here, but you can see the growth of the conference in terms of uh, attendees. Also notes about keynote speakers and celebrity attendees that we've had in years past. And then just some of the cool activations within the event that really do drive traffic and uh, get business owners excited. Um, this is a bit about the agenda. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a three day conference. Uh, there's a plenary kickoff. There's content. Uh, throughout the day and the networking activations in the evening. So uh, we look forward to a silent disco and silent auction on Thursday night, our night annual gala on Friday night. Um, and then I mentioned the brunch cruise on Saturday, our pitch competition, and there is a closing kind of diamonds in the sky VIP party. We feel like we deserve to celebrate. We work hard as business owners. Um, and so this event kind of does it all from that perspective. This is a bit about what the type of sponsorship looks like. Um, it is exclusive naming rights. There are, uh, you get a sponsored table in terms of the gala, uh, main stage naming rights. So the BDW plenary stage is named in honor of the city of Portsmouth. Uh, celebrity meet and greet, swag placement. So we'll be looking to have city of Portsmouth items there uh, to be able to share with our attendees, hotel stay, ad placement, et cetera. But these are the individuals that we're working with. So kind of the next steps, we are uh, hoping to close contracts by end of month with Emmy Award winning actress and entrepreneur, Tabitha Brown, as well as author and award winning speaker and the founder CEO of Operation Hope, John Hope Bryant. Um, that's kind of still under wraps, right? We haven't ruled that out. So let's keep that in this room if we can. Can we go back just quickly to that slide and make sure? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other piece that I was hoping to share today has to do with a five week program uh, that we've developed to support the business plan development needs of entrepreneurs, recognizing that this is how ultimately they're going to have capital to scale the business. So, this business, business architect program, I'll be capped at 20 participants per cohort. We're focusing exclusively on licensed enforcement based, based businesses that have been in business between zero and seven years. Um, it looks like five two hour sessions along with one on one coaching. That is our model that has gone very successfully with other programs. We just underwent an external evaluation uh, process with Virginia Tech and really finding that 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 we're looking to do is actually happening through that model. Um, there is a pitch competition at the end of that five weeks. And again, the primary deliverable there is about a complete and well-structured, fundable business plan, including complete financials as determined by the organization. Uh, just a bit about the curriculum, the things that you would expect, defining your business, market positioning, uh, financial planning, revenue strategies, marketing strategies, and operational planning. A lot of times we find our businesses get that mixed up, right? They want to focus on marketing without having really thought through the financial planning. Um, then we get into review or five minutes of submission of their business plans, and then of course, the pitch composition and graduation. 
So KPIs that are listed here, things that we're tracking, obviously we want to make sure the participants are satisfied. We're looking to have every person that start that five week program to actually complete it. He's killing it over here on slide. Thank you. <laughs> the quality of the business plans is huge. Um, we work with a ton of banking professionals, accountants, et cetera. Um, who have really helped us to refine our standards for what that business plan needs to look like. They're giving us the feedback, hey, this is what was missing. These things are great. Um, so that's that's a uh, that's something we're working hard at is to ensure that the business plans are quality. Um, the competition during the pitch competition, their performance there, wanting to make sure that the confidence is there, that they can actually articulate what's in that business plan, that they understand the relationship between the financials and the uh, items that they set out in their plan. Capital acquisition. So we're monitoring them for up to 90 days after the program's conclusion to ensure that they are in fact accessing capital. Um, and then business development. So we're talking about strengthening businesses, helping businesses to expand, I'm thinking about the longer term impact of the program. And then follow up success. So because Black Friend does provide kind of wraparound services throughout the year, we're looking to integrate them into our larger suite of programming to ensure their business development journey is ongoing. The cost for this program is $5,000 uh, per cohort. This is something we'd love to see happening two to three times per year. Um, and the city of Portsmouth uh, in harmony with the work that you all are doing to provide capital for the businesses. And I got through it. Was that 15 minutes or less? Yeah. <laughs> did really, really well. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions about anything that I shared. Do you have any idea what the financial impact of the weekend is for the city of Portsmouth? in terms of tax revenue, you restaurants that they may go to. Um, yeah. yeah, would love your help in kind of quantifying that. Okay. Um, certainly we understand that there's an impact. Uh, we are in talks with one of our celebrities to amplify that impact by actually having them visit a number of businesses, something that you know WTKR can follow, something that can actually be tracked. We want to ensure that the city of Portsmouth is significantly impacted uh, by having the conferences. Are there other levels of sponsorship available? There are. Absolutely. I'll just say Black Brand has done an outstanding job since it has been in our community, and we're so excited about it and, and the conference. And it definitely give us some a look. Appreciate that. We're looking forward to hosting Black Diamond Week here weekend here for at least the next two years. So just makes a lot of sense seeing how you all are really becoming the front runner in terms of supporting a small thing. So that's our commitment. And Flair, you were projecting your attendance this year is going to be up and over the prior year, somewhere in the yes. 600 plus range. Yeah. Yep. So we are working with so um, just to correct their marketing genius to ensure that that happens. So just really coordinating our strategy around uh, securing that high level talent and then leveraging that for promotion, hopefully working with you all, working with the communications departments. We're looking to see some growth this year. Absolutely. So I think um, to uh, Chair Mitchell, your question, I think we can work with uh, Blair and Blackburn to try to quantify, you know, 600 um, attendees, you know, what does that translate to in terms of room saves at, at local hotels, um, if they're planning for offsite events or dining out, what, you know, really have a projection as it might look like. So we'd be have to have a follow-up conversation about that. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Oh, what's today? <laughs> no biggie. <laughs> you can sit at the table. <laughs> oh. Well, we'll have a deeper discussion on our closed session in regard to the ask.
Um, your uh, next item under new business is the uh, update on the FY24 business investment grant uh, program. And I believe uh, Ms. Tracy is going to lead off uh, the update for you. Hi, everyone. So I have an update for the real property investment grant. I'll start with overall for fiscal year 24. Uh, we received 34 grant applications. It's fantastic. Um, 25 of those have been approved. I do have one more to them before you today. Total of 21 of those grants have been awarded. So of the, and I apologize, I have a title on there where it says quantity 26, it should be 25. Um, the funding request, as you can see, is $370,202.84. And Bernard will touch on this in a few minutes. Um, the funding awarded so far has been $285,069.89. And our MWBE participation is still holding pretty strong at 54% for overall year. Just for the month of April, so our last round, we received 12 grant applications. 11 of those have been approved. Seven have been awarded. Uh, the funding request is $164,984.92. Awarded so far has been $79,851.47, and we currently have $85,133.45 that is pending, with a round four MWBE participation of 33%. So you can see we got a uh, couple of things here that are noteworthy. Uh, we, in the final round of the uh, fiscal year, we had a surge um, in the uh, number of applications that came in. Um, and as Amy had alluded to, we, we've actually had a, uh, a greater request than we had funding allocated to um, provide for. So uh, we will have a, um, a another discussion, a follow-up discussion on uh, how you would like to proceed with that. Um, but uh, really, really busy fourth round, and I think a lot of um, a diverse uh, applications coming in really throughout the city. Um, and uh, really some some interesting projects that have uh, come in. That was by far our, um, I guess, our highest performing uh, year for the program since its inception. So I think we've uh, fully exhausted the funds in, in the prior year, but uh, this year we've actually uh, going to be doing that and then potentially beyond. So, okay. Um, Bob, could you provide an update on the uh, business development and, and acceleration grant? Okay, so I'll start with the Smart Start Business Development Grant. This is our $2,000 grant for businesses zero to three years in business. Um, year to date, we have 75 grant applications received. Um, 57 of those 75 have been approved. Um, we're still working on a few grants, um, but to date, 50 of those grants have been awarded. Um, so we have spent of that 57, um, the funding request for that 57 has been $114,000. Um, so we have exceeded the um, allowed amount to expend. Um, so we have an additional $14,000 that we will be discussing um, a little bit later. Um, of the 75 grant applications, um, this one participation has been 95%. So we've had three women-owned businesses, 39 women and minority-owned businesses, 51 minority-owned businesses, and six veteran-owned businesses. Um, for this round, this specific round in April, um, we've received 18 grant applications. Um, 16 of those 18 grants have been approved so far. 10 have received funding. Um, the 16 Grants um, total $32,000, um, and we so far have awarded $18,000 of that $32,000. Um, for this round, 94% were SWAM participants, two women owned, nine minority and women owned businesses, 13 minority owned, and um, zero veteran owned businesses. Um, for our Smart Start Business Acceleration Grant, this is our $5,000 grant. For businesses three to seven years in business, we received 24 applications. Um, eight of those applications have been approved so far, um, and we have um, awarded funding to these eight grant recipients. 
um, totaling $32,960.50. Um, of the 24 grant applications, 100% were SLAM participants, one woman owned, four women and minority owned, seven minority owned, and um, zero veteran owned businesses. This round for April 2024, we received six grant applications. Four so far have been approved. Um, so we have funded $18,434 thus far. Um, in this round, 100% were better, were SLAM participants, three women owned, three women and minority owned, four minority owned, and zero veteran owned businesses. Any questions? I have a question for um, Amy and Adam. <laughs> Um, I know we had talked prior that we wanted to go back and say in fiscal year 23 of all the uh, companies that we provided some funding to, are they still in existence? Um, are we ready to, to track that over the last three years, what the run rate is? Um, yes, so um, previously every year we reached out to the businesses to see who um, is still in business after that year of receiving grant funding. So. Um, we haven't conducted that survey just yet, but we will um, reach out to those businesses to see who is still existing. So at our next meeting, can we maybe look at fiscal year 23? Yeah, we can have that information oh, for yeah. the next meeting. There's a question. Do, do just a uh, final question. Great job uh, in getting that impact. Do we try? the uh, economic impact for the city in terms of jobs creation and those types of things for the program? And how do we uh, communicate that to the city or to our citizens uh, for the uh, great job that you guys are doing? We have the capability in Salesforce to track that. Brian, was that information tracked to bring you to um, it's part of the application process and where to apply because some of the applications don't necessarily have um, some data on job creation. For instance, a, a property owner that may be improving their property for marketing purposes. But um, I do believe we've got the ability to track for the businesses uh, the number of positions that, that they have. Um, so we have to try to extrapolate that from our uh, CRM software platform. So that's something we could uh, look at. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, which uh, brings us uh, then to the uh, the next item, which is the ask um, for your consideration. Um, and I'll walk through this. I don't know if you can uh, read that on the screens. Um, but again, essentially, we, we've had a, um, a very uh, successful year. We've had uh, for two of the three programs, uh, uh, greater funding uh, need and requests than we've had funding allocated for the fiscal year. Um, and you'll see for uh, starting at the top there on the left hand side, uh, the Real Property Investment Grant, um, annually the EDA has allocated $300,000 for that uh, program. Uh, we had just over $370,000 uh, in uh, requests uh, through the fourth round. Um, so we're $70,202.84 shy of meeting the funding requests uh, for the fiscal year. Uh, your Smart Start Business Development Grant, uh, you allocate $100,000 for that annually. Uh, we had $114,000 in funding requests, so there's a, a $14,000 gap. Uh, the Smart Start Business Acceleration Grant, uh, that is uh, one that comes in typically uh, less than the uh, allocation. Uh, we had um, $32,958, so just about $33,000 in funding. Uh, requested uh, from that $100,000 budget line. Uh, so you actually have a balance there of uh, just over $67,000. Um, staff is uh, requesting that uh, the uh, two programs that uh, do not have sufficient funds um, be allocated full funding to meet the requests. Um, there is a, a way of doing that, uh, which um, I've kind of highlighted there on the uh, right hand column. 
uh, we would be looking to uh, transfer the remaining uh, balance of the acceleration grant uh, to cover the majority of those uh, funding needs. Uh, we would move 14,000 from the acceleration grant to the business development grant to fully fund that um, program. Uh, we would then transfer the balance of the acceleration grant, which is just about $53,000 uh, to the real property investment grant. Uh, that would leave a gap of just over $17,000 in additional funding that would be needed to fully fund the real estate grant. Um, and then we would ask that uh, you consider transferring um, the remainder from your uh, budget. Uh, we have another line item, which is uh, the economic development grant budget line. And that's really kind of a, a catch all for any other grants that you issue throughout the fiscal year. Um, so that would fully fund um, the uh, the requests that we have received through the fourth quarter of the fiscal year. Um, and, uh, would allow for us to move forward. Yeah. Why do we entertain? Um, why do we entertain requests that exceed the budget? Um, if the, there's a chronological and there's a timeline cut off for these grants and it's chronological submission, why do we entertain late submissions that will exceed the budget? So all of these are um, applications that came in through uh, the end of the round. So it would have been for this round April 30th. So any grant uh, that would have come in from April 1st through the 30th of April uh, would be reviewed and considered. Um, not all of those applications move forward because some are determined to be incomplete or not in compliance with the, the program. Uh, and they're funded in the order that they are received. So uh, to date, any grant where funding was available, they have been approved by staff in our review and then awarded by the EDA. So these are these are the, the ones that are before you now are essentially those that qualify but for the funding. Um, they would have the opportunity to come back in a future round if funding wasn't available, uh, but that would delay you know, their project or their business plan. So um, at the end of the day, the money is all kind of coming out of the same pot, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Um, but uh, uh, they are, you know, there is a cutoff in any application that doesn't meet that cutoff. You can't physically submit an application. So the, uh, there's an online submittal. Um, portal and uh, that closes as of uh, 5 p.m. on the final day of the round. Um, I, I don't think we should reallocate the um, 67,000 to the ones that need the money. Definitely that's a plus. And also we do have that catch-all fund. So I think we should proceed with that. But how, um, I can't remember now for our new budget coming in, did we increase those lines or did we keep them at the same, same as this year? Good question. Uh, we have uh, maintained the funding amounts um, at, and I don't think you have the current budget uh, mm -hmm. for FY25, uh, but we have maintained those amounts. Um, mm -hmm. So just to verify, um, both of the Smart Start programs have um, been held at $100,000 and the real estate grant program at $300,000. Um, okay. We would be able to come back if, if we had a similar situation where we saw that the funding was uh, going to be exhausted and could come and request another amendment at that time. All right. And I think that that was our goal was to get more citizens involved, businesses involved, you know, so the fact that that the requests are exceeding is really, to me, a good thing. You know, it is really helping the businesses that we wanted it to help. And like you said, I think we'll stay, they're staying within the guidelines and the deadlines. So I think obviously we just need to relook it for next year, maybe. Um, but I think we should proceed with the um, requests. Is that a motion? Um, yes, that's a okay. motion. <laughs> just want to verify. And that would okay. be a motion to um, amend the uh, FY24 EDA budget um, to reallocate 
uh, funds as outlined here on this slide. Right. Correct. So with this taking place now, this this should call for immediate re revision of the upcoming budget because if we kept everything that's upcoming the same prices that we as we have here, and this and we're exceeding these, then the upcoming one is no good. You well, could we, you could pretty much look at that and say we're not going to have enough money for future, so we need to increase our line in the future. Just to begin with. Well, that's I guess we need to do an analysis of that because this is the first time we're coming into this. You know, normally it, it, we have never run out of money. Right. We've had money left, so. Right. Well, it's good yeah. to say no too. Yeah. Because if you if you exceed your budget and people are still asking you for money after you don't have any more, it's good to say no. Come back next year when the next the next round and be earlier. Because. Well, I don't think it was. I mean, my understanding of it is that that we they broke it up into quarters, for accepting applications at certain periods of time. So uh, these are people who fell within those guidelines, right? So this yes, is just, and it just exceeds the amount of money. And I understand what you're saying is that everybody may not get funded even though they requested it, you know? And I guess that's what we need to look at for, for, for 25. I think, you know, this was a little bit of a, I, I don't want to call it an anomaly because I think we were reaching our audience, right? Which right. is what, you know, our goal is. Uh, but this is the first time this has happened. Right. Um, and there's a possibility it could happen next year. Um, we saw a, a surge in the, the fourth uh, round of the program um, is really when we had a, uh, I guess, I think a third on average, a third of the applications actually came in in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and what we could do looking forward um, in FY25 is, is kind of track that throughout the year. And if we see there's a, you know, a higher percentage coming in earlier on the year, then we can revisit it. Mm -hmm. And if there's a need to request an amendment at that time, we can certainly look at it. Well, I, I guess what, <clears throat> what I'm hearing you know, uh, as, as a new commissioner slide isn't there's a good news in the sense that we got increased demand and what I think as uh, board members, we need to look at the next upcoming year and do some analysis so that we can gauge fully right. what the demand will be going forward. Yeah, with no background so information on yeah. what businesses, if, if businesses yeah. are staying in business, I have to be giving them this money. No. I'm, and I'm, with more businesses coming forward to get money and, and no data tracking whether they're staying in business. And that's what we should think we, we should adhere to the budget. should be doing. We should hit going the budget forward. and yeah. not have a budget that's so flexible that you could just change it whenever you want to because you have you you deciding to exceed it. I think we're saying the same thing. Okay. I, I think we need to do that. Yeah. And so in the future budget analysis, we can figure that out so we don't have to come back and do this again right. next year. Right. That's that, I think what with our finances, we need to have a, a, a different type of analysis coming in for it, you know, to look at all of those factors, because obviously it is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a good thing because I, I think what I, I'm I'm excited as as a new member of this board is once we get the word out that we're doing all this great stuff, we should anticipate upward trends of people coming in asking us for those grants Definitely. that we're doing, Definitely. because as I talk to people on the street, a lot of them aren't aware of what we're doing. So we, we need to be in a position of anticipating that more people, sorry about this staff, <laughs> are going to be coming up asking, how can they get funding? I mean, I remember I, I went to the event we had at the uh, restaurant over here, and a lot of people are not aware of the programs that we have. And the more we do the great things that Autumn's doing and all the rest of the staff, uh, we should anticipate a upward trend, which is great for the city of Portsmouth, but it's going to impact our budget in a way that we haven't historically done. So. so is there a... Um, I was emotional. Motion. Okay. There's a motion on the floor. I'll second it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner James. Um, 
Hearing no further discussion, I'll read the roll. Uh, question. Could it be with conditions in terms of the analysis of checks and balances with this money? You know, making sure that these businesses are still staying viable for the next time. So that's a good point. We're not giving out money. We want to help all citizens, all businesses. However, checks and balances comes in where are you still open next year? Well, what was the criteria for them getting the money? Did we see their business plan? Did we see their chain of action on? Did we see things that could be alarming or concerning to why they're not being viable? You know, to where if they didn't get the money the first quarter, the budget is the budget. Reapply for the second quarter. Budget is budget. You have the opportunity. You know firsthand, hey, we, we ran out of money this quarter for this. You're first up if you get your things in by deadline. So you're already first come, first serve for the second quarter. So we can kind of stay within those guidelines of that budget. And with that, still having checks and balances for viable businesses. There's no point in giving all these grants and things out, and then you're not open next year. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to attempt to answer the question. <clears throat> so the, the program has specific uh, requirements for a business to qualify. And part of that, qualification processes, they have to have what is determined to be a viable business plan um, that is reviewed and in many cases uh, by staff, but in many cases by partner organizations such as Black Brand, uh, where they may have participated in a cohort to obtain <laughs> training in starting a business um, or another partner organization like the Hampton Road Small Business Development Center. So an applicant would come in and, and would have a business plan. That's a, a requirement. Um, in, in terms of their, um, their feasibility, viability, performance, um, that is something we, we do track. Uh, we haven't pulled the report for last year yet. It, um, a business can obtain its business license through the end of March. Uh, so we'll have to pull the Commission Revenues data for last year's businesses to see where they are. We do monitor that annually. Um, there are no requirements for a repayment of a grant if a business goes out of business. That's a risk that all businesses would um, incur, and, and really um, that first year of business is very risky. Not uh, many make it. Um, so I, um, in terms of conditions, I'm not really sure what we could could or would institute. I would, I would recommend that the businesses that creating that's creating an over overages on budget be considered first for the next next round instead of don't admit omit them, but consider them first for the next round instead of increasing this budget to accommodate them because you can't do that each time there's an overage. That's that's in, that's that's not that makes sense. The challenge is is that fair when you have one grant that is not being utilized, all the funds for it. In our case, this they don't qualify for the grant. They're they're applying for a specific grant, and that. they're creating an overage in a specific grant area. Absolutely. And if there as a chronological acceptance of the businesses, this business is qualified first. He's using this much money. This was the last business that qualified. He's absorbed all the money in the grant. Now these three companies come in, they qualify too, but instead of saying we're going to put you on the next round, we want to increase the grant to give them more money. It's, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I, guess, I guess what I'm advocating is that our number one goal is to support small businesses. If we have a grant program that's underfunded, in this case, by $67,000, would it not be appropriate to move those funds to the other programs? Um, at the end of the day, it's all, it's all, it's one pool thing. So why earmark it separately? Well, because things like this, let's just say the request for the property. I mean, I'm not, it's I'm, not that we're asking. I understand what you're. I understand yeah. what you're saying. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying you know budgets realign themselves all the time based on usage, utilization, and those types of things. What we're saying is just just say they had more people that made a request because their air condition went down. Or whatever it is they had to do physically, it had to do. They didn't expect. And so that made more grants in that category because these things happen because it, it, that's that grant. And that the ones that business acceleration grant, they didn't have as much usage and because they tend to be your initial right. grant. Right. So we're not saying to just increase it because we got these many people. We're saying that to allocate the monies that we already have for these grants because the need is greater in the other categories. 
So I agree, you just don't increase your budget because you got more people asking. You know, I'm thinking this is more a realigning it based on the need. If the realignment didn't didn't cause for additional funding, so if that sixty seven thousand at the bottom line was to, could cover everything in the other two grants, then I would be with it. But we still have to add more money to it. Even using that sixty seven thousand that wasn't out, that wasn't absorbed, we still have to add more money to this. So it's not logical to me. It just doesn't make sense. It makes more sense to tell those people to come back next grant round to apply there because you missed the. You missed out on this budget. We only had a certain amount of money for this round. And unfortunately, your grant was submitted late and you can come back next year and be submitted and be considered first. But and this is for fourth quarter, correct? This is for the fourth quarter. So we're closing out the fiscal year. Yeah, this is kind of a so to be I fair, call it a clean up, but we're we're squaring up with what the requests were versus what the actual funding was allocated for at the start. So I think to be fair, I think I would be in favor of increasing it to finish out the budget. But as we look at fiscal 2025, um, looking at some considerations for raising that budget and with the guidelines that we've already discussed, all of us, I think all of us have some great points. But just to be fair, we don't want to finish the fourth quarter and then the word gets out that, oh, well, they told me to come back next quarter. Well, they didn't tell me that from second quarter or first quarter. And now we're not looking equitable. I think this, 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 the discussion for increasing the budget for this program will be great for fiscal 2025, but to finish the year, I'll be in favor of. Well, we always have the option in any budget to come back absolutely and request additional funding. We'll go with the vote. And we can choose we can revisit that or at any point in time that could be next to the next meeting and. Mm -hmm. Point up throughout the year. Um, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, just so that I'm clear, we have um, Sandra Smith, you have made the motion. Uh, Commissioner James had the second. Um, and this is for a budget amendment for fiscal year 24 uh, to amend the business investment grant uh, lines uh, as. Provided here on this slide as uh, dollar amounts. Okay. Um, I'll proceed with reading the roll. Uh, Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Brown? No. Nope. Mrs. Saunders Smith? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. And Mr. Harmon? Yes. Chair, the item is adopted by a vote of four to one. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are moving on to uh, new business real property investment grant, and uh, Ms. Tracy is going to present uh, two items uh, that we have for consideration. Oh, again. The first grant I have for you is an FY23 grant. This is for Kennedy Suites. It's located at 6205B Portsmouth Boulevard. Uh, just as a reminder, um, the scope of work for this project was um, taking a previous nail salon and turning it into a co-working space. So he created eight office points that and the project included drywall, insulation, um, insulation walls for those office suites, as well as interior and exterior paint, lighting, and HVAC work. His total project cost was $62,000, in which he requested the full $25,000, which was approved. The project work and documentation was completed as of May 1, 2024. My request today is that he has actually requested a retroactive extension for his project so that a reimbursement package may be submitted. Wanted to go over a timeline with you. Uh, this grant agreement was executed as of May 30th, 2023. 120 days to complete improvements. His completion deadline was September 27th, 2023. Um, just as a reminder, his initial de deadline did coincide with my maternity leave. Um, October 27th, 2023 was the 30 days uh, to submit his payment documentation. So that was the deadline. On November 16th, 2023, he did submit the 
payment, paid in full invoices, as well as proof of payments. Those were both dated as of September 28th. On November 21st, 2023, the property was inspected and photos were taken uh, by myself. And as of that date, his certificate of occupancy and business license had not been received. As of April 26, 2024, he had received his certificate of occupancy and May 1st, 2024, his business license was issued. Um, while we were in communication with this grant recipient throughout those months, um, and there were opportunities for extensions, unfortunately, those were inadvertently missed. So the request today is for a retroactive extension. His work was completed within the required timeframe. He did come across issues when it came to inspections. He did fail an inspection and had to make corrections with the building officials. And he was able to pass those inspections and get a certificate of occupancy and business license. What's the amount? 25,000. And this is for FY23. So this would not affect the budget. Thank you, Justice. Okay. Yeah, these uh, these funds, the twenty five thousand dollars, had had been carried over from the FY twenty three fiscal year, so it's been accounted for from a, a financial budgetary standpoint from a prior year. Um, and this is really um, kind of a one off instance where we had um, an application a grant that just say uh, missed the initial. Uh, deadline for when the extension would have needed to be um, provided administratively, which would have uh, then triggered all of the other approvals uh, that would have come before the EDA, um, which would have provided adequate time for uh, the project's completion and um, uh, to meet the performance requirements uh, up until the end where he had uh, delays with the inspection. Um, there were a number of reinspections required uh, for some small items that um, were corrected ultimately that uh, resulted in the issue of the certificate of occupancy and the business license. So um, the uh, recipient has uh, met all of the uh, intents of the program and uh, they were, I'll say, mostly in compliance with the performance requirements. Um, it just with that one initial deadline that was missed and got off track. Uh, so uh, we're bringing this before you to, to kind of rectify the situation. Um, and uh, this is the only instance of this occurring that, uh, that we've been able to get. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it has no impact on the, this year's budget? No, I mean, it's, uh, it's your prior FY23, which would have ended June 30th of 2023. Oh, okay. so we just asked and we've carried these funds. The, the finance department has booked these monies and carried them forward. I'll, I'll just call it a liability. They're on the books. Right. Um, so they've been accounted for as, as, um, as an expense in FY24. Okay. I'll make a motion that uh, we approve the request. Second. Any discussion on the item? Hearing none. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mrs. Sandra Smith? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. And Mr. Hartman? Yes. Uh, Chair, the item is adopted by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. The next application is for FR24. This is for 455 Dinwiddie Street. The applicant is Riverside Shipping. He is currently in 451 Dinwiddie Street. He purchased the property next door to expand his business. His scope of work is um, replacing all of the exterior doors and windows. He is demolishing 40 feet of interior wall to be replaced with an overhead beam. He is demolishing the existing drop ceiling and it will be replaced with drywall. And then he is replacing all of the interior flooring by the is total, right, total project cost is $52,000. He is requesting the full $25,000, so 48% of the total project cost. 
photos. This is currently the interior. It is broken into three areas and he wants to make it open concept and have not cubicles, but office. There's going to be five office stations or desk stations. Um, but you can see everything is pretty outdated. This was an old Bayport Bank, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see all of this will come out the drop ceiling, the old tile flooring, also carpeting, um, and then almost all of the meat. It's in here at all. I can answer questions on this easy information. <laughs> Motion uh, by Treasurer Saunders Smith. Second. Second by Mr. Harmon. Starting the discussion on the item. Hearing none, I'll read the roll. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Saunders Smith? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. And Mr. Harmon? Yes. Uh, Chair, the item is approved by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Uh, your last uh, new business item is a small business financing committee update and um, I ask for uh, Commissioner James to help me out on this one. Um, we have had two meetings of the uh, finance uh, committee. Um, at the last meeting, we um, were joined by um, Mr. Jay Grant of LISC uh, Hampton Roads and um, had a good discussion dialogue on uh, LISC's ability to provide um, some financing uh, platforms and vehicles for small business, um, looking at uh, specifically um, providing working capital uh, to new businesses and expanding small businesses. Um, and I think we have some really good takeaways uh, from that. And uh, with that, uh, Commissioner James, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm push on the spot <laughs> um, to ask for your uh, input. Well, I, I, I think it was a, it was a good meeting uh, uh, with us. He basically went through some of the historical analysis of what the list organization had done not only statewide but nationally and um, talked about the platforms it, it wasn't really a lot of uh, historical that they've done in the city of Portsmouth was primarily a lot in Virginia Beach and um, you know that was the essence of what they were talking about having to do to grow small and minority businesses and uh, help small businesses uh, perform. And I think uh, uh, the chair, uh, Neil, reached out and said, you know, give us a little bit more historical data of what, what your capabilities were and what your capacity would be if we ventured into uh, uh, having programs in the city of Portsmouth as well as Hampton Road. So that was my key takeaway. What was their response? Hmm? What was their response to that statement? No, no, that was that was the question. But they didn't respond to it. He said he would get back to us. OK. And that was my. The, Correct. So that additional information will be compiled and uh, right. discussed with the uh, committee. And then we're the plan would be to bring that before the board uh, with a uh, recommendation I had before. Right. So he didn't he didn't respond to that question he said i'd have to go back and do some research and look at what you're talking about so you were very proud of us commissioner brown that we asked that question <laughs> i'm just joking with you but 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 we did and it was a very good question uh a conversation that we had because i i i, I see the need for us to do something as a board uh, to fortify that, the challenge I think with the commission is to figure out what their capacity and what will be the value added if we bring them on board. And and I think that's the question that we would have to discuss uh, with them. And is the 
amount of resources we would have to move with that match to benefit for the Portsmouth business community. I guess that was my own takeaway. Right, but yeah. I, no, I, you already said what I what I was oh, missing yeah. for the impact is more in Virginia Beach than in Portsmouth. Well, right now their 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 presence has always their historical presence, and I don't want to speak for Neil or my takeaway is the 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 presence that they've had to date is not has not been important. Right. right, absolutely. Cool. Okay, so it's. Been so the numbers that he was talking about and he talked about were not Portsmouth based. Now they did have a survey, uh, a geo survey, which tracked where the businesses were located. And a lot of those businesses that they had helped based in Portsmouth were located in Portsmouth. So we asked to get some follow up on that. Okay. And just to, to follow up on that, um, and uh, Commissioner James Thomas, the Virginia Beach uh, activity that Liskins had was because Virginia Beach had provided funding for Virginia Beach specific programs. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a Virginia Beach was focus area of LISC. It was that Virginia Beach engaged LISC to administer grant programs specific to Virginia Beach, right. similar to what you all are proposing to do for boards. All right. So it's one of them. Good point. To clear up on that, just to make sure that was. Thank you for that clarification. So we will be coming back to you, I think, when we've received that additional information with uh, an update and hopefully a recommendation uh, at your July or August meeting. Another question for Commissioner Matthew. You might be able to help us out with this. The, mm -hmm. the, the Biden administration has allocated, from what I understand, Millions of dollars for small businesses, and I'm sure the state has done something. What is the best way to get access to those funds? Is there is there a department that kind of articulates the requirements to get that money, or um, do we need to have someone whose primary focus is looking at capital that's available for small businesses at the state and federal level? I mean, any sense on? Why did we talk? Um, not to cut you off. No. You know that was one of the positions we talked about augmenting economic development board to go after those types of funding um, because there are funds out there. Um, now um, I don't know the city's perspective on what do they do about going after because I think even Commissioner Brown, you told us about dollars that were out there last year about some that we had not use to leverage our dollars and i think we need to figure out ways to leverage our money now and, and so that's going to be an important you know component to it and that was one of the positions the, the new positions that you were acquiring? uh well there's a grants uh program administrator position but that's uh more targeted towards administering the eda grants uh so um your business investment grants um Programs like being discussed right now, the financing programs, they would be kind of overseeing that. Uh, but certainly, we're always staff um, in the office. We're always looking at additional grant opportunities, whether it's um, you know through the state of Virginia or federal grant opportunities as well. When this, when this committee was being formed, I thought it was being formed with the intention of Portsmouth looking at providing small businesses who were being considered for sub, as subcontractors funding they need to to gap between actually doing the work and getting their first check from the primary contractor. So the all the outside businesses and LISC and all of the other agencies, they're fine because they, they've already been doing this before. But I thought the, the formation of this committee was so that Portsmouth as an economic development authority could provide these fundings for the contractors, subcontractors who were, who were chosen to do a job by a primary contractor that didn't necessarily have the money money to do to buy the equipment or the material they needed to do the job. This was like a short term interest free financing opportunity for those businesses. So how do we stray away from that? I don't think we have. This is a program doing specifically what she just articulated. So it's a um, 
Love this is already there, so before. This is already there. So, but the, and not to not to this the meeting that we had was just to find out in my mind, and unfortunately, Commissioner Neil uh, Neil's not here. Uh, Neil Barber. The meeting that we had was basically to get some historical and data or well, what list was doing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to talk about what you just talked about. Right. So we didn't stray away from the core of where this committee wanted to go. We just wanted to find out what, for lack of a better um, now analysis, what the environment looked like. And we knew, I think, uh, Neil felt that LIS was doing a lot of stuff in this platform, and we wanted to find out what they were doing and what their capacity was. That was the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So we haven't strayed away from what you're talking about. Uh, getting back to what uh, your your question was, is a great question. I think that um, trying to get a understanding of what federal grants are out there, I would encourage, and I hate to ask Brian to do a little bit more. I know he's got his plate full, but if you call uh, the chief of staffs, uh, Senator Warner, Senator Kane, and ask them what grants are out there, they typically, or any of the congressional, Bobby Scott, they can probably get back to you. And we can do that maybe at a next meeting if you want to talk about what resources are out there and what the timeline is. I'm sure as a, as a, I'm sure yeah. Mr. Donahue knows all that information already. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he the has information is out there. It's, it's just trying to figure out how to navigate and how to pull it in and and how to um, access it because it's not as easy as they say they say you know there's a hundred million dollars out there it and is. there are hurdle rates you got to go through and we're open to exploring any opportunity for yeah, funding yeah uh, especially yeah. in south side so i was just trying to suggest yes. the, the question that uh, yes. was, was raised yeah there's there's a lot a lot of numbers floating out there but trying to get the capacity to get them and Autumn shaking her head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes there's a requirement that you have to partner with another mm -hmm. you know, community or an organization. Uh, yeah. Because as a locality, you don't always qualify your own. Yeah. So that's something we've run into with workforce development funding, uh, where we have to partner with a, a regional organization um, so that we can yeah. stand a fighting chance yeah. in that. So I, I, I think. I think the, the the answer to that question is better suited in excuse the expression a retreat <laughs> because it's more than it take about two hours to us to talk about that, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. But it's a great question. Okay, well we've got some follow-ups to do there um, on that last item. Okay, uh, we are in need of a uh, closed meeting. And there is a closed meeting resolution that has been prepared. Uh, I do believe that um, Mr. Saunders Smith uh, is in possession of that resolution. If I could ask yeah. you, please read. I move to go into a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711-8.3 for the purpose of discussing the disposition of real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position on negotiating the strategy of the public body, specifically regarding 1220 High Street and waterfront development, and B, pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711-8.6, for the purpose of discussing or considering the investment of public funds for a completion where competition or bargaining is involved, or if made publicly initially, the financial interests of the governmental unit would be adversely affected specifically regarding the LISC Hampton Rose Emerge Program and Black Brand. Certi certification of closed meeting made pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3712D. That's, that's actually for when we come out. Oh, okay. Yep. 
Second. Mr. Brown, I will leave the uh, roll call vote. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Smith? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. And Mr. Holman? Yes. Uh, Chair, the item is approved by a vote of five and zero. We are now in a closed meeting. I hereby move that each commissioner certify, certify that to the best of his or her knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from opening meeting requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting just concluded. Second. Roll, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Sandra Smith. Yes. Mr. James. Yes. And Mr. Harmon. Yes. Chair, the item is adopted by a vote of five to zero. We are now in an open meeting. I believe there is a um, special okay. need to add an item to the agenda. It's be a motion to add. A motion to add an item to the agenda regarding what was it? List. Yes. List and emerge program. List and emerge program. Okay. I'll read the roll. Uh, Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Cassandra Smith? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. Department? Yes. Chair, the item is approved by a vote of five to zero, adding an item to discuss the LISC merge program. That'd be a motion to approve a $50,000. I make a motion to approve the $50,000 startup fee for the LISC emerge program. Second that motion. Commissioner Harman and Commissioner Brown. Read the roll. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mrs. Sonner Smith? Yes. Uh, Mr. James? Yes. And Mr. Harmon? Yes. Chair, the item is approved by a vote of five in zero. Uh, we are now on to items submitted by board members. Any items for discussion? Let's see. Okay. Move on to report facts. And um, Ms. Amy Tracy has uh, a update on the business directory. Okay. I've been working with our website developer. There was an ask to add a SWAM business filter to our business directory. Um, they have added it. It's I need to able to see from my screenshot. Apologies. Um, when you go to business resources and the business directory, this is the page that you see. And the filter is right here. You click the button and you'll see all of these businesses change. If it's a SWAM business, it has a check mark here and that will show. Um, if you go into the industry categories and you click the filter, it's the same thing. It leads up everything else out. Um, once, sorry, I've also gotten the Commissioner of the Revenue's Office to provide me with an up-to-date listing of business licenses, active business licenses with business locations in the city. Um, it is taking a bit of time for the one on that report. It's over 6,000 business names that I will receive along with their address. That is the only information that they can give me. But once I do receive it, I will get with our website developer again, and we will update our directory. Um, at that time is when I will also update and add additional industry categories. Um, and then we will also run the Virginia SWAM certified business listing and update the directory. Just as a reminder, this is a it's a self-reported thing. So I have the certified SLAM businesses, and then of course the businesses that we work with through either your grant programs or just on a day-to-day -day basis of meeting with businesses to identify if they are SWAM. Those may not be on the certified SWAM list, but we will include them as a SWAM business as we know that they fall into that category. So 
It may not be as comprehensive as we hope, but as we meet with more businesses, we'll be able to update the business directory. It's um, that part is simple on our end. It's a it's a check mark that I will click literally <laughs> in the background. Any questions on something updates coming in? There's, okay. there's probably no way to cross check it with the state certified. Yes, uh, I'll run that report as soon as I get the Commissioner of Revenues report. Okay. And that way I can match them together. Thank you. Also be interesting to cross check against the catalog of businesses in the disparity study. Mm -hmm. So they cataloged by industry yeah. or by those genre of industries, if you will. Uh, so making sure that we have that cross check as well would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Good job. What's the, as much data as you could collect is, is helpful. That's a good job just to have that simple yeah. add to it. Yeah, you may be one of the few municipalities doing that. But, but yeah. Blue Beach has a really good one, and I, I think I shared it with you guys, but yeah. Blue Beach has a really good um, business directory up there, yeah. and it's self-reporting as well, but the, the type of data they, they collect is, is very intense. That's good. Well, I'll take a look at theirs to yeah. see what we might get in there. Yeah. Good job. Uh, before we move on, Amy, to stand up. <laughs> uh, we have Brian has some news to share. Yeah, so um, some bittersweet news. Um, we are going to be uh, losing a team member here in August, and Amy um, is getting ready to uh, relocate with her family um, uh, to Louisiana. Yeah. And, um, Louisiana. Her last day with the office will be August 16th, um, unless I can convince her to stay longer, <laughs> which I'm going to try. Um, but her uh, her husband, who is uh, retiring from the uh, U.S. Navy, is is it, uh, going to be accepting a position in Shreveport. And uh, so she's going to be uh, with you for just one more meeting, I believe. Um, but uh, she's been a great asset to the team. We're going to miss her. So, but excited for the opportunity that she's got and uh, for her family as well. So, uh, Amy, other, any other details you want to? I'm putting you on the spot here, but any other details you want to share? So, some of you may know my husband's active duty Navy. He's attached to the USS General Orange Ward. He is a nuclear reactor operator and their assistant quality assurance officer award. Um, so, he's on a fantastic opportunity in Shreveport, Louisiana, with a company called Alloy Piping Products. And he is now their nuclear quality manager. He's actually working for them part time remotely now. And we'll move into full time. Um, the company currently designs and manufactures piping products for the oil industry, and they are looking to shift into the nuclear industry. He's a submarine guy, so he knows those reactors in and out, and he's about to stand up an entire quality program. Um, he's extremely excited about it, loves to tell me details that I don't understand on a daily basis. So I peppered him with questions this morning while he was showering, and I'm learning more and more about the industry. Um, uh, we are fortunate enough that we're going to take some time out of work and spend it with our baby. Good for you. Good for you. And the baby. Good for you. And the baby. Good for you and the baby. So it'll be a really great time for me to stay at home and watch him grow and we could just call any time with my kid. Great. Great. It's great. Yeah, we're, we're excited. Yeah. It's a great opportunity. Um, it's a place we've never been. So if you have any tips on Louisiana, I told it to. Good food. Yeah. Exactly what I've heard. Mosquito repellent. I've also heard that. I have more issues with mosquitoes and alligators. So. Oh, we'll certainly miss you. Yeah, we will yeah. always be. Just a Thank great you. asset. Always responsive. Always enthusiastic. A great promoter in the city and EDA. And um, I'm going to miss seeing the baby pictures. Um, but you can always email me with some updates. We'll miss you. And funny, um, I was at an EDA meeting the morning my water broke. So that's the right. kind of commitment we. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Make them work. Oh. <laughs> But Amy, no, thank you for uh, for everything you've done to, to help uh, the office out, the UVA out, and uh, yeah. Portsmouth out. So 
uh, we, we appreciate it and we're going to miss you. Okay. Um, Mr. Mitchell, thank you for that uh, time to share that. Um, do we have no other items? Uh, for this meeting is officially adjourned.